do it. Aha, uh-huh. little red hey. dot, little red dot. Must be successful. That's good to see. Yeah. Okay. So real quick intro. Um, uh, I'm not going to edit this. I don't have the time or any of that. So uh, this is Ken. He's from, uh, he's a chief scientist at uh, C60 Purple Power. Um, if you don't know me, basically go look it up. I haven't got the time to introduce myself. <laughs> so, so, uh, Ken is, um, he's real sharp in a lot of different things. I want to talk to him for a few minutes today about uh, C60 and some uh, interesting effects. And then about this uh, crazy ass idea I have that we're calling the uh, intergalactic interweb. Okay, and so um, Ken's introduction to C60 came about due to uh, basically fears of radiation, correct? Yes. Okay, and so my, my point in bringing up C60 is not to pimp this stuff. Please, please confirm to everybody that you don't pay me a dime on this. You send me too, no, far too many bo- damn, damn bottles of this stuff. Yeah. I can't consume it that much, but other than that, I'm not getting paid for any of this, yeah. correct? Okay. Yes. Um, I personally think it may be a, a good time to pimp C60 into the general population a little bit harder because of the anti-radiation benefits due to the fires in California. Yeah, and oh, there's also one thing on um, one of our produ- our suppliers has been totally bought out by NASA, and I know oh. another company that's totally bought out by NASA, and uh, so yeah, so they're yeah, they no longer so NASA's uh, figured out the benefits of C60, and they just been buying it by the kilogram after kilogram, so something's happening there, and you don't know who they might be passing it along down the line to somebody else too. We never know. Right, but right. That's, but it know, always that's, struck me yeah. as, you know, Van Allen belt, radiation, C60, hmm, you know, yeah. maybe something there, right? Yeah, it took them a while. NASA's a little slow, but I guess they finally caught up to it. <laughs> but that's yeah. happening. Uh, so anyway, so uh, people in California may want to consider the um, mitochondrial scrubbing benefits of C60 in an atmosphere that may include radioactive particles brought out by fires and the fire suppression techniques. And the C60 works by taking out the, um, uh, the residue of the part of your cells that make energy for you. And those are the parts that are uh, more acutely affected by radiation than other parts of your cells. And they're um, the gathering point for all of these like waste products. And that's what C60 does is to remove all this stuff from your system. And so it it does have anti-radiation benefits because radiation basically acts as a super oxidizer. It it basically sort of burns you internally to say that. And so the C60 comes along and clears out all of the waste. So the waste itself doesn't cause you any problems. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. And are you referring to like the out in Southern California where it burn up, where that Simi Valley nuclear Correct. reactor melted down? Correct. And I got testing once and actually I'd been exposed to plutonium because I was actually a kid living in Santa Monica area when that little sucker melted down, I think. So oh. I, yeah. So one of the, the tests. So that's anyway, that's a, that's a little close to home. And then yeah. my dad, family, dad grew up in Paradise, California. You know, they sold, I think they sold the house back in the 70s, but there's nothing left now, I'm sure. Yeah. It's all gone. Well, also the whole area now owned by Boeing down in there, uh, okay. as well as the downwind portion of Vandenberg and all of those places oh, yeah. where all of the rocket fuels, because the rocket fuels frequently put down layer after layer after layer of radioactive um, waste material in the process of burning their way up into the atmosphere. And so the, the whole area is uh, extensively covered with um, uh, radioactive material going back at least to the 70s. Oh, I, I'm think, I think that semi reactor went down in the 60s. In the it? 60s, right. That was, that was the big layer. Oh, oh, the other stuff, yeah. I mean, yeah. they're constantly doing whatever. Yeah, who knows what goes on down in Vandenberg. Right. So, and part of, part of the problem with Southern California relative to radioactivity relative to fires is that it's dusty. There's 1% humidity. So radioactive material is not going to wash through the soils the way it does up here in the Northwest where we got, you know, 13 inches of rain in three weeks, right? And we have very porous soils. And so when they go on in to do firefighting, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to bring up vast quantities of dust uh, along with, and the fires themselves because of the inferno they create are going to just suck dust up into the atmosphere and sort of like vacuum clean it up into the high atmosphere and it's going to fall back down again. At this moment, if you go and look at the wind patterns and stuff, it's all blowing offshore because of the Santa Ana winds. That, uh, that won't persist 
and when the uh, winds shift back due to the current changes, then a lot of this radioactive material, should we still be having fires, uh, will re uh, precipitate back into the Southern California area and it'll come down through the atmosphere. So C60, in my opinion now, is really a good uh, radioactivity scrubber. Yeah, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't probably hurt to have a face mask or something to make sure you don't inhale some radioactive oh, yeah. particle. Yeah, and if you're on, um, uh, you know, if you're in an, uh, exposed in a dust environment like that, certainly wear, wear uh, nose protection and so forth just to save the lining of your, uh, uh, of your um, systems from the abrasion of the dust itself, you know, if no other, no other purpose. And then one other, okay, so, so there's that about C60, you know, it just might be a good time to check it out. Um, okay, so uh, one other thing here, okay, a weirdness. Um, so I was um, uh, maybe end of this January, no, it, was, it would have been the end of February of this year. Uh, okay, so I have a small flock of laying hens that I got in 2013, seven birds. Over the course of time, uh, the bird's age is now yeah. six years on. I've only got three left out of that seven. Okay, and uh, uh, they were, they're basically retired. Uh, when we moved here in February, uh, two of them were reasonably healthy and one was in a molt and didn't look good. Didn't look like it was gonna come out of that molt. Um, and uh, you know, when it's an odd time of the year to be doing it anyway. Uh, but in any event, so we move here, they've got a nice coop, they've got good wind and all of this sort of thing. And I thought, well, what the hell, I'll give them some C60, see if it perks them up, right? Now, these birds at that point were basically uh, nearing six years old, and they had stopped laying. They're retired. They had stopped laying maybe nine or ten months back. Well, I started getting eggs again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's like, after a nine or ten month hiatus, right, and, and healthy eggs, there's a, a bared rock bird and two uh, maracuna birds that lay the green Yes green eggs and um and uh eggs are healthy they're very uh orangey yolks because they get a lot of uh you know uh carotenoid containing stuff here in in their diet and so uh i can only and the bird their plumage is better and they look like they're doing well and the one that looks sickly is uh plumped all back up again and they look like you know they might even be able to take on a small raccoon you know they're looking beefy so to speak right and and laying again I got ill in July and uh, was not able to tend them basically in June and July through this emergency surgery and stuff. And finally got back to giving them C60 again uh, about two weeks ago. And so it's taken two weeks this time, but the first time I gave them C60, it was like within, I don't know, maybe four days or five days they started laying again. And so here it's been uh, 14 days, but we're back to, I got an egg this morning. And so these are six-year-old birds. Yeah, um, that is amazing. Yeah, I could never retire. I could never kill off my chickens too when they stopped laying yeah, eggs. And yeah. Chicken retirement. I'm too soft for that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I owe them. You know. I mean, I, yeah. I get good protein and so on, and and I don't have to. So it's it's all right. I don't have to. Right. Uh, yeah. But interesting. Interesting about the C60 and the resurrection of the reproductive process within the. Um, and I notice. Uh, no offense at all to the people that produce the live pet product, okay? But I noticed a distinct difference between that C60 with the modifying components for the joints of the animals and all of this kind of stuff in, um, I think it's olive oil? Yes, I think so, yes. I think so, I, 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 don't, I don't know for sure, but I noticed a distinct difference between that and giving uh, my um, now nine-year-old dog C60 purple power. And, the, and there's a number of differences uh, in the impact. Uh, the dog actually uh, it seems to do better without the additional additives, um, it, the pure C60, or maybe it's just the different kind of fat within the oil, I don't know. Uh, higher level of energy and so on, and a reduction of all different kinds of what had been um, uh, growth irritations like a papillomavirus, right? And, and so a lot of these are reducing. And I can only put it down to the C60 because I'm, uh, other than the occasional vitamin, which I force her to eat, she doesn't oh, like them. I could do a quick hypothesis on that. I can't, you know, it's just a hypothesis. But I'm thinking that uh, when you put the attachments on it, it probably prevents it from operating in the mitochondria. 
the way uh, oh not, sure sure stick wood. and so because if you got something sticking on it it's not going to work in the mitochondria so i think that uh like a pure c60 or natural c60 whatever you want to call it is uh it does that in the mitochondria and there's a whole bunch i do a, a little c60 show and every week or twice a month every second and fourth wednesday and so each i have a little topic so if anybody ever wants to go back go look at the c60 show and i i did a c60 show back a few weeks ago or a month ago on that ex subject if they want to get in more in depth. I don't want to take up too much time here. Yeah, sure. And also I, I need to note that there's a number of articles at the National Institute of Health that you can pull up on their database about using C60 as a transport vehicle for, for various different yeah. kinds of drugs. They're all in trial at the moment. Oh, and yeah, yeah. people also need to know, um, they need to know a difference between like liposomal delivery C60, which is what you know most C60 products are, they're dissolved in oil, versus hydroxylated C60. They have a process where they put 24 hydroxyls or more on a C60 and that makes it water soluble and then they can inject it in directly into the bloodstream. Right. So that's a whole different chemical, it still has positive benefits, I'm not saying that, but it also has some negative benefits because of the hydroxyls attached to it. So just make sure when you're reading something or checking it out, there's two different, it's a different delivery method, totally different, uh, it's essentially a different molecule when you put 24 hydroxyls on it. Eventually the hydroxyls bleed off and it goes to back to being a regular C60, but in that bleed off process, damage can be done. Yeah, so. yeah. In any event, like I was saying, just, you know, I was, it was just a goofy experiment just to help my retired chickens out. I had no intention that they, you know, no clue that they might lay again. And I don't know how long it, it, would, it would last, whether it's a spring back effect, right? Well, because they've had, for people too, they've had some women who've uh, gone through menopause, they start uh, having their periods again, and they're taking C60. Oh, so, okay. Uh, that's another. Okay, well, well, here's here's something that may be the mechanism for that. Okay, I've gotten because I had the cancer. I've gotten into a deep study of a lot of these um, uh, components that affect cancer, and I'm quite convinced, probably against all uh, academic reasoning, uh, that cancer is not a disease; that it's a conditional response, and that this conditional response requires at least twelve genetic expressions to be turned on in order for a cancer to exist. It needs some form of an active trigger, an event that can't be undone within the body. And that the um, uh, uh, continuation of the cancer and its growth needs to have these gene sequences fire off in a particular way over time and continue to be expressive as other parts of the process are brought in in order for the cancer to grow. So I have a, a condition that is uh, genetically... Uh, I have genes for schizophrenia, okay? Schizophrenics don't die of cancer, not even lung cancer. My brother smoked three or he smoked so much the whole house reeked and it was almost better to tear the sheetrock off than when he passed, you know, than try and get the smoke smell out of there. Uh, no, no sign of lung cancer or anything. He reduced his lung function, had, you know, uh, emphysema that they call COPD, but he didn't have cancer. I've had two cancer diagnoses from uh, my exposure to chemicals way in my youth. Uh, neither one of them have metastasized. I've actually had three cancer diagnoses, two of which were confirmed. Um, I cured one giant area on my head with Curaderm out of Australia, which is what they use on cows down there to make some... Is that like the black salve? Oh, I'm sorry? Is that like the black salve? That's no, it's, it's, it's pure white. And, it, and oh, it, you know, it's, you know, you, you actually, you know, it's, it's related to the, it, it's taken from the scrapings of a plant that's related to the egg. Oh, plant. yes. I know. Yes. I heard about that plant. Yeah. Okay. And that one is... That one's really incredible because if you've got a skin cancer, and I don't know that it would work on melanoma. I had a basal cell carcinoma that was in an advanced stage, but it was still, it was at an advanced growth, but it was only stage two, you know, right? And uh, it stings when you put Curaderm on there. So, and, and it only stings on areas of your skin that have cancers on them. You can slab that stuff all over you. And if, and if there's no cancer there, you know, it stinks a little bit, but you don't feel it. The reason I got it was because I had a dog that had a cancerous growth on his foot. Put the stuff on there. And I'm talking a serious size growth, right? Put the stuff on there. And after and it was a big black yucky thing. And after about, I don't know, three days, it fell off. Literally just fell off and there was pink skin underneath. And he had another one or two reappear and I put more Curaderm on there. So ever since then, I've just kept, kept the stuff around. I get the basal cell carcinoma diagnosis. Um, they, I get irritated at allopaths because of mis or being undiagnosed in my major cancer for all these years. So at that time, I was very irritated at this uh, dermatologist um, 
physician assistant that was uh, in charge of my case. He was just an arrogant son of a bitch. And so I put Curaderm on there. And then when they called me in for the surgery, which he was going to lead this team of four people to do, I walked on in and, and let them see that it wasn't there anymore, guys, <laughs> that I'd gotten rid of it. <laughs> that was tough. And, basically, and basically told him, you know, sit on spin. <laughs> anyway, um, but the thing about cancer is, having been through the cancer experience repeatedly, I'm quite convinced that certain things about uh, my understanding of this uh, are the case, that it's not triggered by a single uh, genetic expression. It requires a number of genetic, a uh, number of genes to fire off, but it's not. So everybody that has, say, a particular kind of skin cancer won't have the same 12 to 15 genes firing off in order to cause that cancer, but they will have at least 12 or 15 based on the type of cancer they've got. And, and those 12 or 15 might be found within a set of, say, 50. So, those, so it would be those 50 genes firing off in a particular sequence at particular times that cause an individual to, to develop cancer. Um, and if other ones don't fire off, it won't ever metastasize. So my oncologist is like baffled, right? Because he, he knows from the surgery and the size of the mass they removed from me that I've had this cancer growing in me for perhaps 15 or 20 years. And in that entire time, it never metastasized. It, it was entirely located to the intussusception of the, was exactly in that spot. So it was caused by that friction back and forth of the intestines over the period of time. And uh, so they, we know the trigger was this, but the, the whole aspect of this that's interesting is uh, first off, the, uh, I heard back from the phlebotomist and, or no, the, um, uh, the anesthesiologist that in my case, and he said they were just like shocked at how red my blood was. I was near death, okay? I would have died, if I hadn't done something, I would have died that day or the next. Um, it was at that, that stage. But they were shocked about how they thought they'd tapped into an artery uh, and because the blood was just so red. And even, though, and even though I was in a hugely reduced condition, I was down to 142 pounds, um, uh, I had, um, good liver function. I had good, good lung ability. I had 97% oxygen. Uh, you know, so, so I never, never went in for oxygen. So they were quite convinced I would come through the surgery. Uh, but that if I hadn't had the surgery, I, I would not have been around to, you know, to bitch about it. Right. Um, but anyway, so getting back to my main point on this, uh, these genetic expressions, all right. Uh, cancer, for the most part, is not a young person disease. Cancer is something that you age into. And so we can make certain assumptions based on our understanding of uh, genetics and genetic expressions today that lead us to the idea that genes, are, especially the cancer genes, are more potent or more impacting on you as you become older. So there's obviously other genes that make you less resistant to those uh, gene complexes being turned on. And I'm speculating now, I'm speculating at this point, that it's stem cells. That when you're younger, you have a higher level of daily production of stem cells relative to uh, mature cells in your body. And that as you age, that ratio changes such that you actually end up with a bigger body over time. And so that's going to influence it. But you also have the, the lower production of stem cells relative to the mass of mature cells. And so it may be that there is some balance issue in there relative to those uh, for genetic expression that would bring on cancer and so forth. And the idea here is that C60 affects the quality and production of the stem cells, even in older people. And it may even do so in older people in a... Uh, directly proportional way to the amount and time of taking it. Yeah, that's, I believe that. Let me, uh, I should have put this. This will improve the, uh, the quality. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so, yeah, well, that's actually one of the things that uh, we've come up to. One of the things we were looking at is the people, a lot of people have been taking C60 for two or three years, and uh, they go get telomere tests. And the telomeres, like most of the ones, you know, are in their mid 50s or late 50s, and they get a telomere test, and it comes back with telomere lengths more characteristic of somebody in their mid 30s. And so we've had that, and uh, I was mentioning that on a uh, show, 
And, and, and I also suspected that, because how, how is that happening? How can you increase telomere length? It's, doesn't, it's not supposed to happen with mammals, right? You don't, can't increase it. Well, what we found out is that C60, like on the mitochondria side of things, when cells get senescent or even cancer cells, they kind of go into an aerobic or anaero, anaerobic uh, metabol, oh. metabolic system. Right. And, uh, and, and what they do is they change the acidity in the cell and suppress SOD, super oxygen diamutase which is in the mitochondria, so it basically shuts the mitochondria down. But when you take C60, C60 gets into the mitochondria and basically replaces SOD as the, it gets rid of super oxygen basically, which is a really super powerful uh, oxidative radical. So C60 neutralizes that, it restarts the mitochondria. And the mitochondria are symbiotic bacteria that live in the cell. They're mm -hmm. you know, part of the cell, but they're still, they have their own DNA. And so what happens when they restart the mitochondria in the cell, they send little chemical signaling messages to the nuclear DNA and if, of the cell. And if the nuclear DNA doesn't come back with the right set of messages, uh, this, the mitochondria will initiate apoptosis or program cell death themselves. They don't need <laughs> Right. That. Yeah. And so that's what's, that's what's happening. We found that C60, you know, it just gets rid of the senescent cells and, and just wipes those out. So those are the cells. Most senescent cells have, you know, we, uh, telomeres, just for the, the listeners, the telomeres wrap around the end of the chromosomes, and every time your cell divides, they get a little bit shorter until about, after about 50 divisions, the cell can't divide anymore because the chromosomes would dissolve. And usually cells that are senescent don't want to do that last division, so they try to shut down because they don't want to die. Well, C60 kicks the mitochondrion, apoptosis goes, and they're gone. So when C takes C60, it gets rid of all the, uh, a lot of the, the senescent cells, cells with shortened telomeres. But we also found people started calling me and sending me messages that, They've been taking C60 just for a few months, and they went in to get stem cell treatments, and they had, like, this guy's a 70. He had the highest stem cell rate these guys had ever seen, right? He's, he's, he's like one that a kid would have, and yet, you know, he's in his 70s. So, uh, so that seems to be it. And so what happens is it, the C60 knocks out the senescent cells with very short telomeres, and then it stimulates the production of stem cells, which then differentiate into new tissue types and organ types. And then they, and, and right after a stem cell turns into a new tissue type, it's like a baby cell, like a cell in, let's say, a baby's liver or something, or a baby's kidney. And so it tends to go undergo a whole lot of divisions. So it goes 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, you know, 32, 64, 128, 256, you know, 512, 1024. <laughs> so one cell can, uh, can make a whole bunch of cells before it stops really divi dividing and those cells become working cells in whatever organ or tissue it is. And so literally when you're taking C60, according to telomeres, your average telomere length is increasing. That's because your actual, your average cell age uh, is, is right, reducing. You're, you're, little, you're literally getting younger. Right, it's, right. It's, yeah, it's amazing. And that's, that's one of the little discoveries we've made. I mean, we're coming in with new little discoveries as, uh, as we go. C60 just always up, well, up with new surprises. Yeah, it's it's really interesting stuff in a couple of different layers or uh, ways. Um, ran into some oceanographers that were uh, deeply involved in some weird stuff I need not get into uh, around red clay at the bottom of the ocean and uh, how the red clay had at one point in its process of becoming that red clay, the sediment down there, uh, basically it's like you imagine this... Um, uh, mud mask, if you will, going through the ocean as it goes down, it picks up, you know, fish teeth or all these things suspended. One of the things that it's known to, to get out of the seawater is C60. Oh. Okay. Um, this particular kind of red clay, this particular layer, these scientists were looking for the, um, uh, the markers of C60 within the red clay layer, and what they found was there was this whole area that there was none. And it was like the red clay was in all ways the same as all the other areas. And they finally figured out it's these worms. These worms are actually seeking out these little tiny things. I mean, you know, I wouldn't qualify them as a worm. We're talking something that's uh, microscopic in nature. And they're actually zeroing in on and sucking the C60 out of there and going about their business. And that's, that's why the other part of it is, which is these, they thought for a while they were finding residues of, of little nodules that were more C60 than the surrounding area, right? And it's the death of the little worm colonies. So, so rather odd, you know, it's obviously a, a, a respected molecule in nature. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, other subject, because I got to, I've got, sorry about this, I got to get moving on. Just one of those days. Okay, right? okay so uh, just to let people know, I had this wild idea, and the wild idea follows a, a certain logic chain. Uh, humans invent uh, technology, let's say that we didn't steal it from alien spaceships, okay? And um, we invent technology, we get to where we are now that we're talking over wires and, and Wi Fi and everything on the internet. It's logical that other species would invent something similar if they were a species that wanted to communicate with each other. There are some species we could imagine, like Romulans, that would say, nah, I don't want to talk to him, you know, that kind of thing, right? Or Klingons. Klingons would probably be more aggressive that way. But anyway, the internet offers a lot of benefits, as we've seen. Vast quantities of money, it turns uh, all of our world over, uh, you know, literally turning it over, over on its head, and, and uh, mostly in a positive way. So it, it stands to reason that other species would develop this. It also stands to reason that other species that may go into space would want the ability for the spaceships to call home, to phone home, and, and they would have some form of internet that wouldn't be Wi-Fi, wouldn't be radio. It would be some other mechanism that would allow the spaceships wandering off into their particular solar system to call back to their home planet. It's my speculation that the only thing that really fits this bill is quantum and entrained particles. Well, uh, unfortunately, I gotta grab that. Hang on just a second, okay? Okay. Hello? Hey, I'm online now with, with Ken. Oh, cool. Okay, bye. Uh, Are we good? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So sorry about that. Anyway, so um, uh, anyway, so uh, we invent uh, right now. By the way, the Chinese are doing just that. They're they're figuring out ways to entangle two particles, separate the two particles, put one of them out in space and one of them down here on Earth, bash the particle in space with a hammer, and the and the <laughs> particle down here on Earth jumps. And if you do that, you could even do Morse code, and it would be an effective way of communicating. Well, not effective, but it would work. And so the idea is that we would have an internet that didn't, re didn't require any amount of transmission media between the two because the particles would be entangled. And thus we would have a galactic, uh, or certainly through space, available internet. And uh, it turns out, by the way, <coughs> that the reaction of quantum particle entanglement is about a billion times faster than moving electricity. So uh, internet would be about a billion times faster, or another way to think about it, it would have potentially a billion times more bandwidth. Um, should you run on ent entangled particle internet as opposed to trying to do it through wires. There's also some other th aspects here. We've got SETI out there with the um, big dishes looking for radio. Well, what if radio and television broadcasts are on a, on a technology curve, a very finite amount of a society's uh, lifespan? In other words, we assume that someone's out there broadcasting radio for 5,000 years so that we can receive that signal uh, because it would take that much radio to material to come towards us. Well, what if radio is a phenomenon that as soon as you basically discover it, less than 100 years later, you're onto the internet, everything goes into wires or local, and it doesn't get broadcast out into space anymore, and you disappear as a radio beacon. We're in the process as a planet of doing that. 60 years from now, maybe we won't emit, you know, but a small fraction of the radio image that we do now. And so under the circumstances, those kind of assumptions are not necessarily valid. However, it is, it is actually happening here on Earth that the Chinese are currently inventing the quantum entangled internet. They're entangling these particles, they're gonna put the particles into doing all different kinds of work. These particles are but one of a, like let's just say 16 quanta phenomena that can be exploited. We're exploiting different phenomena with quantum computing. This would form a quantum internet. Now the, the thinking that takes, and that's all factual, all that stuff's happening right now. Now the, the leap of thinking here is that these other species would likely develop along the same kind of a technological path that technology would be the, the constraint rather than the species themselves. If that were true, then, then other species would discover and create quantum entangled internets and, and build these. And 
in fact, maybe even previous species on this planet millions of years ago, whose civilizations have died and gone uh, away, created such and, and sent stuff out to Saturn on a, and were sending signals back and forth on these quantum internet stuff. If this is the case, then what we need to do, or what we could do as humans, would be to discover what those entangled particles are, and then we could start decoding the material, or the information going through that entanglement, and we would have potentially a, an, you know, an internet, I jokingly say, that we could get the Pleiadian porn off of. But the idea is that we could get all of the technology that other people put on the internet, and maybe some, some species puts all their government records and, or recipes or who the hell knows what, right? And we discover this, there's probably, as I say, about a thousand years worth of, of discovery at a bare minimum, just even touching into a galactic internet. And because we're a relatively new species, a lot of these um, uh, solar systems are way older than ours, I think we're late to the game. So I think it exists already, and all we really need to do is to find it and hack it. Uh, and so the next stage is to decide what course of action would make sense in terms of what materials to look at as the potential carrier for the entangled internet, uh, or, you know, the intergalactic internet. I had thought cesium, but I'm way wrong with that. It's just not going to work. Cesium couldn't be used as an entangled particle. My other thought was tungsten simply because there's no naturally occurring isotope of tungsten. But that's not necessarily true in other solar systems. I was looking for something that was like um, a definitive uh, characteristic of a material that would suggest that uh, look here, look here, you know? Yeah, well, there's, well, that's what I think what I talked to you about, the monoisotopic uh, yeah, concept. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, most metals come in, uh, in multiple isotopes. An isotope is just, they have the same number of protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons. So if you were using a metal like copper that might have four or five, you wouldn't, it would be with all those different isotopes, it would be hard to sustain a quantum signature because you've got all these different isotopes and each one's going to be a different state. But there are some elements in nature, uh, metals that have monoisotopic. And the big three one, the, the one, there's only one in the heavy metals category and that's gold. Gold has an is atomic number 79, 79 protons, and it has 179 atomic units, or I guess that'd be about 100 uh, neutrons. And all the isotopes are like that. See, it tells you it's monoisotopic, only one type of isotope. And two other metals also, one is sodium, and the other is beryllium. Beryllium, I think, is uh, what, atomic number four. So it's, it's really small, and there's, there's yeah, beryllium, it's beryllium nine. And then, uh, and then there's sodium, and I think, and, and, and then there's nothing for, you know, sodium is what, I don't know, 11 or 12 on the whatever, no, it's uh, 21 on the atomic chart, whatever it is. And, but, but gold's way up there at 79. So there's nobody near gold. No, almost all the heavy metals have four, five, six different isotopes. So, I mean, if you were going to do a quantum device, you would want to use gold in the circuitry or maybe even gold crystals for the resonators. I'm just saying that, uh, that, that you want to have things monoatomic because that would give you a uniform quantum signature. I mean, I'm not a quantum expert. Sure, I study sure. quantum. No, no, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, now, uh, actually, what you're saying, though, about beryllium makes me think it's a better candidate than gold on a couple of different uh, levels. But, but one of the things I had thought was uh, a way around the monoisotopic approach uh, would be to use a gas. That might be sodium because sodium is easily made into a gas. I mean, look, you've got sodium lights everywhere on Earth. Exactly, exactly. So and actually, it's also extremely reactive and, you know, when purified, mm -hmm. it, you can't deal with it, et cetera. So yeah. some, of these, some of these characteristics. So I was thinking of, um, uh, and, and, you know, maybe it's because of a, a fondness for vacuum tubes or something, yeah. but I was thinking that perhaps that would be the, uh, one of the things to explore as the uh, base level of, a material but the problem is that we have as okay now actually you've made the problem worse okay so so so, so <laughs> Oops. tell tell everybody about the um the space aliens and how they do things with metals oh okay that's just you know they've they've got alleged fragments of metals from alien spacecraft you know you can say yes or no but anyway the thing about them is they're monoisotopic like they had this one they think it came off a flange of a saucer and it was layers of monoisotopic magnesium and bismuth One's diamagnetic, one's mag uh, paramagnetic. So there's layers of micro layers of them. But the thing was, all the metals were monoisotopic. So, and, th and they, have, they must have the capacity, because I, I think bismuth probably has six iso stable isotopes, or whatever it does. It has a lot. 
And so the same with magnesium as two or three, but they've been able to, they have the technology to separate and make monoisotopic stuff. We don't, we don't really have that technology. We can, we have to go with what's available in nature, like beryllium, sodium, maybe gold, because we just don't have the skill. I mean, we do stuff, monoisotopic separation, for instance, getting U-235 from U-238 for the atomic brothers, right? I sure, mean, that's huge something, cost. Yeah, 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 exactly. So for practical reasons, until, you know, we get some huge increase in our technology level that allows us to take monoatomic uh, metals. And each, when you do take a metal and you break it down into its monoatomic forms or monoisotopic forms, they have unique properties. They're very close to each other, but they also have new unique properties. So if we could take the periodic table of elements, which has 70, 70 something metals in it or however it is, and we were to break it down, we would and into, we could make a monoisotopic, we'd all of a sudden have uh, three or 400 metals. Right. Which would right. give us which would be a huge technical boost because we'd be able to do all kinds of things we never could before. And maybe quantum communication is one of these things. And that's really the route that we need to go on this. Now, I was looking at some monoisotopic um, uh, design discussions in quanta, quantum computer programming forums because they have to come up with algorithms for materials testing. And, and it turns out a lot of this stuff goes is uh, uh, resolving itself back to um, Buckminster Fuller's approach with his synergetics books and the underlying uh, tetrahedral structure of reality as we go forward. Right now, um, I, as an aside, I had discovered or I had come to the conclusion that I needed a. Um, uh, okay, so uh, in my. Uh, screwing around with time stuff. I was doing some time experiments and I was creating a, um, uh, an irreducible or uh, event within a box within that box, yeah. which was completely shielded uh, in as uh, much as I possibly could from anticipated um, uh, penetration of external stuff and leakage of internal stuff. And in that I'm using uh, what, what amounts to cling film. Okay. A specialized cling film to do polarization of the negative entropy that's created by the um, uh, irreducible event, you know, the irrecoverable event. Yes. And I had been using, I tried using the escape of radioactive material from a small amount of ore that happens to have uh, uranium in it. And it's, you know, I use it for calibrating Geiger counters, that kind yeah. of little tiny bit, right? And um, anyway, so I'd come to the conclusion that the polymer film that was being supplied to me uh, at some trouble, because I had to provide the engineering to it, uh, is effective. But what I really need is, a, is an isotropic layer, uh, a polarizing layer, probably of aluminum and of uh, some metal here uh, in doing this. Now, aluminum will, re will reduce and stop the penetration of the time stuff by 50%. Okay, it's, it's a shield. Get enough layers of aluminum in there and you get this reduction event. So that's what my box is. It's just basically layers of aluminum shielding with spacers in between. Um, and so I'm convinced that the nature of the aluminum uh, could be so much more enhanced if I was able to get the, as I think of it, the impurities out of the, out of the stuff. Because I've got, got one sheet that was just uh, I don't know if it was the first or the last part of a chopping or whatever the deal was, but it was just almost as though all of the crystals of the aluminum were all in, oriented in the same direction. And I, I was able to notice far less effects on the other side of that sheet of aluminum than others. So purity and alignment in this is clearly going to be uh, an issue. And so isotropic is the, undoubtedly the way we've got to go. Now, for some reasons I can, okay, so I can buy gold as circuitry but I don't know that gold is reactive enough to be able to be the molecule that you're bashing on the head in order to send the signal, right? Yeah, that's probably, you're right. I mean, maybe the gold would make an excellent uh, circuitry because it's conductive and non-corrosive, but yeah, you'd probably need something like sodium or beryllium to be bashing right. to, to get that signal. Because they'll, they'll, they've got, you know, they got a lot more atomic reactivity than gold does. Gold's very non-reactive. Yeah. Exactly, and so that's why I first looked at cesium. And then I became convinced that radioactive materials, even though cesium has some unique properties that way, uh, just are not going to be used uh, for this kind of uh, application uh, in a generalized sense in virtually any species because of the nature of putting radioactive stuff in every network card, <laughs> you know, basically at its core, right? <laughs>
<laughs> you, you wouldn't want to do that. So anyway, though, so, um, uh, okay. So that aspect of it is, uh, aside, I mean, the using radioactive materials aside, uh, yet another reason, by the way, to uh, have C60 if you're monkeying around with, you know, calibrating your Geiger counters, guys. Um, the, uh, so my next target on this, I guess, is going to be beryllium, okay? Uh, sodium presents some challenges. I think I would have to go to a, uh, it's not, wouldn't be possible for me to get a, um, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe it might be possible to get an uh, aerosolized individual sodium crystal captured somehow and still be able to get signal to and from it. But, yeah. but that's a lot of engineering for me. Yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah. Sodium reacts so much with water vapor. It would, you know, you see th throw sodium in seawater and explodes. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, so yeah. It's probably not. Yeah. But really, you've got to be careful with that's a nasty metal in and of yeah. itself. Yeah. And then of course you could, I don't know, maybe gold plated gold, you know, they got that really, really thin gold film that they put on statues and stuff. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. We've actually got, I've got, got some of that here. Gold leaf. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 Gold leaf. Yeah. So, but it's difficult. And then the other thing I brought up, I don't know, maybe some of your listeners can help me on, on you on this one, but that Hartmut Muller, I don't know if you ever got yeah. a look at that stuff. Yeah, this guy, I mean, uh, it's from a long time back ago. He supposedly he had two types of resonators. He had a resonator that was full of Mg magnesium silicate oxide, O4, and it's like the main stuff in the mantle of the earth. Yeah. And he also had a biological resonator, maybe a DNA sample. And then that was the basis of his communication system. And he made this communication, I think it was from St. Petersburg, to somewhere in Germany. He had a whole bunch of people. They observed it. Then he did another where it was in Germany to someplace in Australia on the other side of the earth. And he was, it was communicating, you know, probably like a more, uh, I guess just talking, uh, you know, basic talking circuit. But it was uh, used 0.6 watts and appeared to be instantaneous transmission. But right. um, all my stuff on Hartman Mueller got lifted. And... Uh, and, and so I don't, have, uh, I don't have my original documentation on that. And w when I went later to research this stuff, it's like he disappeared or all this stuff, a lot of it just disappeared. It gets, disappeared. Vac it gets vacuumed up. Yeah. yeah. There's actually so a I, yeah. So I don't know, you know, but it was like the two resonators. He had, the, he, used to, he had this thing about standing gravitational waves, which travel instantaneously. And so he put the message, at least in his view, on a standing gravitational wave using the main bulk of the earth, which of course is the mantle, using the main material in the mantle, and some biological sample he didn't elaborate on. So if somebody out there, so that almost sounds like a quantum communicator in his system, but I just don't have the data anymore to, to contribute because it's all gone. So if right. there's somebody out there that has that, that would be great to communicate because that might catch us up on a, a few pointers. Or if Hartman, Hartman is out there, <laughs> Let us yeah, know. Hey, yeah, send a message. Yeah, let's chat. Yeah. 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 Well, that's like uh, the fellow in the early 1920s that had the um, box full of uh, vacuum tubes that had radioactive material in the vacuum tubes in the form of nodules and various different chemical compositions that was able to get more energy out than he put in. You yes. know, this kind of thing. Or Keeley with his uh, remarkable yeah. implosion engines that just disappeared. All that stuff just gets vacuumed up. Co the only reason we have the extensive files we do on Cozy Rev is because he's Russian. And, yeah. You know, and, and so the Russians pursued the, uh, the work. So, yeah. Well, yeah, if we could get that, that would be great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go. We've been on here an hour, and I need to get okay. ready for the That's next fine. session of stuff. That was, a, that was a, good, uh, a good little talk there, and we can continue on with this. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm still looking for Hartmut's, Hartmut's ruler stuff, but I just, you know, I... There's a little bit on the internet, but a lot of the places I go, there's not, nothing there anymore. So uh, it's a dead link.